Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Discussing a Murderer. With me today is the full panel. We'll start off uh, from the top, as usual, and say hello to Big Jeff. Hey, Big Jeff, nice to see you. It's been a minute. Hey. It's been a minute, hasn't it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me back. Um, I have a bold prediction today, and that is we are not going to get through two minutes of this episode. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, continuing our uh, the episode on IMFL, a topic that the guilt is absolutely hate because, uh, you know, there's just so much shenanigans, so much point to uh, a planting of evidence uh, and uh, Brendan and Stephen's innocence regarding IMFL. It's the thing that uh, solidified in my mind uh, the innocence of these two men and, uh, you know, the... the, the uh, there's not, not a guilty that's going to make it 10 minutes into this episode. So for that, on to the next. That's a nice, bold prediction. I like that one. On to the next. Dr. Silkman, welcome back. I think there's a lot for us to chew on today, it looks like, in this episode. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's good to be here. I'll tell you what, this is going to be an absolute doozy of an episode. Uh, really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Jack, uh, welcome back. Nice to see you again. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks for the invite back. Hello to, uh, you know, Big Jeff, Doc, and Cal, and yourself, and all the live chatters. Uh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, two minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, Big Jeff. We'll see. Should be good. And Cal, good morning. Good morning, panel. Good morning, everyone in chat. And, yeah, I'm definitely ready to get going and starting this episode. Tell us where she was shot in the head. No, I mean, where? This is, it demonstrates that he doesn't know what the hell we're talking about. I'm sorry, guys, to stop it. I didn't make it f three seconds. I think that's the record, <laughs> Big Jeff. It certainly is, but, I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, he, he is not capable of cognitively processing um, what – they're telling him and the best he can do is sort of parrot back what he thinks they're, you know, they've told him before. Or, and, you know, he's obviously is not someone who responds well under pressure. You're going to get what you get out of him. And it, it, it's not going to be the truth. It's going to be whatever he thinks is going to get them out of his face in the quickest. In the garage outside in the house. In the garage. Okay. After obtaining the information that was obtained from Brandon, we felt that there might be uh, areas that uh, we needed to recheck for blood evidence for items used in the commission of these crimes. Agents and investigators continue. Yeah, this has got to be the most bizarre investigation you have ever seen in your <laughs> life. If it weren't so tragic, it would be laughable. Um, and you know, as we pointed out many times before, uh, I don't think that you were going to magically produce uh, item FL out of thin air anywhere but inside. Um, and there's just, you know, there's simply no forensic evidence that backs up uh, this shooting in the garage. It's obviously completely manufactured. Uh, there have been you know, a lot of activity on Reddit very recently. Uh, you know, what, why, you know, if they had this mountain of evidence, why did they need Brendan's confession? Um, there it is. I mean, it, it's uh, to, to procure item FL in a, in a hood, latch, hood latch swab. Remember that item FL is the game changer. Never, ever forget that item FL, Ken Kratz himself, labeled the game changer. Uh, and if the game was going well, you don't need a game changer. It's really disingenuous about this. It was a game changer because this was, I'm, I'm completely convinced it was a setup intentional because they needed something big and he, Kratz knew it that if their forensic evidence against Stephen Avery was so strong, it would have been Brendan Dassey who, right? Quite clearly, the uh, investigators, Fassbender and Wiegert, uh, if they were logically hearing the rubbish that was coming out of Brendan Dassey's mouth, uh, what the investigator should have said to him was, look, go back to your mother. You clearly know nothing. You're just making all this up. I like to look at end result because there's so much of, uh, you know, what starts an event we don't know about. We just see end result. But I look at November 2005, December, 
moving into January, getting into February. So we've got this, you know, almost five month stretch of span that Kincrest does nothing. The cops do nothing with Brendan, nothing. And, you know, if, uh, and they knew, they knew he was there. They knew, and they don't do a damn thing with him at all. And I have to ask myself why. Number two, add to the RAV4, the, the hood light swab, knowing, you know, I, I'm just trying to connect the dot, uh, another dot here or another uh, extension. If Stephen had left all this amount of touch DNA on the hood latch, what about the prop, the prop arm? And there's that, I don't, I don't think you guys, they even tested it. Now I question that plus the battery, the battery cables, only the hood latch. And I'm sorry, it's got to go further than that. It, it must go further than that, especially if, you know, if he's uh, an active leader, as Ken Kratz basically testified to. Uh, you know what? At the end of the day, I, I bet you Ken Kratz and the investigators hoped that Item Phil never showed up. Sounds like it was as, as, as irrelevant as uh, who erased uh, messages on Teresa's voicemail. Um, <laughs> uh, well, with regard to the judge not wanting an answer, right? Yeah, and, you know, and, and to stick up for my friend Kel for a second, it is, I think, important to draw a distinction between uh, the court's ruling on item FL uh, and, you know, she, uh, she can probably recall exactly uh, what they ruled, but obviously just, they dismissed everything, everything with it to the, you know, the, the common sense uh, that we're trying to apply with regard to what it means. Because at the end of the day, what we're, you know, um, what we're saying kind of is if Sherry Colhane had uh, done the planting test on item FL, it would have come up planting. But unfortunately, there is no such thing as a planting test. But every single smell test that I'm aware of that employs common sense says there's no way uh, after multiple searches that they miraculously discovered this after leading him there, uh, you know, in, in the questioning. Uh, you know, the, the way that we ended the last episode podcast was, was uh, with uh, Fassbender saying, well, we know something happened. We know something happened in the garage, Brendan, uh, outside. What, 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 where was it? And that was just prior to the clip that we saw at the very beginning. So, you know, it just it doesn't pass any smell test at all. And that, and that is a different um, question than the one that, that Kathleen posed that kind of had to get answered by the Court of Appeal. You know, just to reel us back in here a little bit to where we were in the documentary, the point that, you know, and I just wanted to confirm in the chat, and thanks for backing me up there, Big Jeff. Um, the thing that Pagel doesn't mention is that MTSO has no reason to be there yet. James Link, that's what uh, Big Jeff confirmed for me that that Link was there. I don't know if Ben deliver sandwiches to the boys. <laughs> Remaker was there too. I always think about DCI's relationship to the other um, jurisdictions, right? They're kind of the big boys. They're the state, right? They also know how to cover their own behinds. And I think that if they thought MTSO was messing around, they're going to ensure that they've covered their asses. And if this ever comes back around, MTSO is going to take the fall, not DCI. I think there's a lot of inter-department politics that are at play. Like, we're not going to go down for you. We'll help you to a certain degree. But if this ever comes back in appeals you're going to be stuck with. And that's just my own kind of uh, feeling about it. I don't have any evidence to back that up necessarily, but I think that's kind of how things operate. You, you should uh, quantify that about Dettering's report. And he said he didn't hear that damn dog bark. If he didn't hear an alert in that laundry bathroom area, then why did they go back in there? That's a lie. <laughs> yeah. uh, not only that, um, not only did Dietring lie, but... Um... Also, Remica lied, and because uh, I found the documents, it's actually quite shocking uh, what was actually done on the night of November the 5th. There was, a, I believe, a strategic plan in place. Um, that's when the fix started. Um, the boys from the MTSO made a huge mistake, and they noted the blood, and they said, this blood has to be from our victim. The Stephen Avery property, we are searching his residence and searching the garage uh, near his residence because we now know 
that the garage was part of the crime scene. I would ask if Detective Wiegert would bring you exhibit 277. And can you identify that exhibit that's in front of you, Ms. Cully? Yes. <clears throat> this is crime lab item designation FL, and it is a lead bullet fragment. In your opinion, the cause of death here was one or two gunshot wounds? Yes. To the head? Correct. All right. Tell the ladies and the gentlemen of the jury what information you have here that allows you to conclude that either of these gunshot wounds occurred while the victim was alive. That is, bullet struck bone while that person was alive. That I was um, given information that there was a spent bullet recovered at the scene that contained the blood specimens of... Um, not based on science, it's based on what he was told. Um, this is amazing. This is a medical examiner. This is a medical examiner in front of a court and a judge, and he got one fundamental fact wrong. He said, uh, I uh, heard that the uh, bullet, the spent bullet, had the blood of the decedent, which meant that it struck skull, went into uh, Teresa Horbach's skull, uh, and somehow, and went into her brain, and somehow that bullet was found on the ground. The only problem with this uh, is it's a multifactorial issue for a start. When Colhane looked at the bullet, did she find any blood, tissue, brain matter, skin, hair, anything? No. No. The bullet was clean. The bullet was clean. So that's why Colhane had to put the bullet in a buffer because she did not see any blood. So normally what a, what a forensic scientist does, they take a swab and they do a presumptive test. They get a little bit of blood, if there's blood on there, and they do a presumptive test to say, oh, okay, there's blood on this object. Um, I can now do another swab, do an extraction of DNA, bang, bang, there you go. However, when Colhane received the bullet, she saw nothing on the bullet. Uh, that's extremely worrying when one considers that this soft lead bullet uh, hit skull, caused beveling, went inside Teresa Horbach's brain, and there's one problem. Uh, the forensic anthropologist never found an exit hole. They only found two entry holes. They cannot even prove that the bullet transited the skull and left it. And we know from Dahan's, um, sorry, Haig's experiments that a .22 bullet doesn't have much penetration power. Uh, the decedent, and that would be um, indicative to me that the bullet had passed through the brain at, at a time where there was uh, liquefied blood or that it wasn't going through specifically bone fragments. Um, and I would think that that would be the predominant, uh, that, that would be information that I think would be helpful in making that type of opinion. All right. We've certainly had testimony that uh, Teresa Halbach's DNA was found on a bullet fragment. Correct. Uh, I at least recall no testimony that Teresa Halbach's blood was found on a bullet fragment, but the jury will decide in the yeah. end. He said, we'll let the jury decide. Uh-uh. That is a major, major issue. Right? He should have went after him. He should have went after him right then. Yeah. Yep, because the medical examiner got a specific fact wrong, which means that the jury are going to say, wait a minute, there was no blood on that bullet. Um, that doesn't make any sense, right? And I bet you, I bet you either Colhane used a, a magnifying glass or the gentleman who did the bullet ballistics put it underneath a microscope and said, shit, there's no bone fragments in the lead. And he kept it quiet. Because you know, we all know that when a 0.22 bullet strikes skull, uh, it you have bone shards, bone fragments embedded in the lead, and you know what? There were none. Red paint, and it should have had blood. It should have had some blood on it. I think that my personal opinion. Well, I think you guys knew that this was coming, but you guys 
like mentioned it so I was in the background getting it all together and I knew this part was coming so I thought it'd be a bit I'd wait a little bit before I entered it but um that's what the courts of appeal actually eventually ruled on was this moment in court when it comes to item fl um so I, I brought it up and I'll, I'll quickly read it it says um so this was their paragraph 45 um, and this is what they concluded in terms of item FL, and they actually reference it back to this moment in court. Beyond that, Avery's evidence is largely irrelevant. The premises of the first claim is that if the damaged bullet found in the garage did not deliver Hallbuck's fatal shot to the head, then it could have not he could have not been the perpetrator. But the state never never argued that either of the bullets recovered from Avery's garage killed Hallbuck at trial. The state showed that Avery's gun fired the bullet and that the bullet had Hallbuck's DNA on it. But the state did not argue that this specific bullet entered Teresa's skull or killed her, nor was it necessarily that it did so in order to implicate Avery in her murder. There is nothing to suggest that the shots fired into Hallbuck's skull were the only shots fired at her or that every bullet fired at her contained skull fragments. There were, after all, 11 castings and only two bullets found in the garage. The presence of Hallbuck's DNA on a bullet found in Avery's garage is particularly damning evidence. Regardless of whether it was the bullet that entered her skull, it strongly implicates Avery's absent, absent evidence that Hallbuck's DNA was planted. At the very least, Avery's new evidence is it, in fact, is not new, is inconsistent with the state's theory of the crime. For me, I think when I first watched um, Making a Murderer and I watched it all and then we saw the timeline, I actually put item FL before the key as um, my deciding factor that it was the most planted obvious, a uh, planted piece of evidence in the whole case. Item FL screams it like it was, you can see the build-up, the lineup. they used Brendan to get it. And for me, it was always the fact that they ha already had the DNA and they wanted more beyond the blood. They wanted touch. They wanted something more and more and more. And this is where they got greedy. In that, what you read there from the Court of Appeals, to me, they, they kind of, well, they do talk about it there at the end, about the implication. But that was the entire thing, really, from the beginning of the trial. It's implied that Avery shot her at least twice because they presented the two bullet fragments. And now they're talking about all these other shell casings that no one has really, really said that uh, for sure that Avery, you know, delivered those, uh, you know, remaining eight or nine shots to Teresa. So they're they're throwing in something there. I, I don't know. I don't like it at all. What what they did. I, I think it was really. Um, it was just a, uh, just a means for them to justify and saying that this really didn't matter at all. Item FL should have never been admitted into the first place because Sharika Cohane contaminated the negative PCR control. So in effect, you cannot introduce something in a court of law when the uh, critical controls um, represent a form of contamination. So the bottom line is this. If you contaminate the PCR negative control, then you've got no faith in the result in item FL because the result in item FL, i.e. Teresa Horbach's DNA in item FL, could have easily arisen as a form of contamination. And we know that Colhane had DNA samples pertaining to um, Teresa Horbach and Stephen Avery in her bench, at her bench. When you get a form of contamination, all bets are off. You restart the experiment. You don't muck around, right? As Kelly read out, they've walked away from Ida Maffel, and even Mr. Kratz said in his book, I never said Ida Maffel struck Teresa Hallbach. I never said that it killed her. We use Ida Maffel to great effect, like a magic trick in court, that, and you should have seen the jury when they heard about Ida Maffel. The whole place went silent. Because now they're saying, oh, my God, the gun in Stephen Avery's bedroom fired Ida Maffel. Ida Maffel must have struck Teresa Hallbach in the skull, killing her. You know what? 
the state didn't even prove that Otomafil struck any bone fragment. They never tested it to look at the trace material to prove that Otomafil had struck bone. Quite clearly, it could not have because we know it didn't have any bone shards. So we've got this, we've got this farce going on here whereby the state is saying, hey, yeah, okay, we presented it, but uh, we never said, we never implied that that's the vessel that killed Teresa Horbach, and yet the medical examiner said it had her blood on it. Guys, do you understand that if it contains the suspect's blood on the bullet, that's an implication that the bullet had struck tissue? i.e. the victim was there. I, I think it's, isn't it worse than that? I mean, in, in Zellner's filing, she actually quotes the metal, medical examiner who was getting a little frustrated with the questioning line of straying. Uh, at the, and the, I'm not sure whether we have it on the, on the cut, but, the, but her uh, reading of the trial testimony, her quoting of the trial testimony says, it got her DNA on it when it went through her skull. So, so, so while I agree with, uh, you know, with a, with the court of, you know, if in order to, it, let, me, let me rephrase that in order to agree with the court of appeals, you have to say, well, the state never argued it means that it never came out of Mr. Kratz's mouth, but it's certainly, as you said, uh, Tony, what was, uh, you know, sort of foisted upon the jury through the expert witness. And, you know, I just wonder at the end of the day, uh, if Kathleen, you know, had it all to do over, if she wouldn't file, a federal appeal that just some of these decisions of the court of appeals were wrongly decided, um, you know, ba based on, based on the, 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 how finally they tried to split these hairs and they're, they're, they're clearly wrong on the facts and wrong on the law uh, in this issue from this non lawyers uh, uh, opinion. I understand, I understand what they said, uh, but uh, to me, it's a, a load of hooey. Well, I was just going to say, and you know, they hoisted this whole thing through this setup of Brendan, how this evidence, it was actually gleaned from Brendan who recanted everything, but they used it anyway. And Brendan was not there. And, you know, it, you know, it, it creates this vacuum of, uh, string and beauty to be able to question it. And I don't know where that falls in the, within, I'm in, I'm in big, uh, in uh, big Jeff's law firm too. It's a non-lawyer opinion, but they used this information from Brendan at Stephen's trial. It wasn't anything they found from Stephen at all. And they had been in that, pardon my French, that fucking garage for, you know, eight days in and out uh, during the November 5th through the 12th uh, time that they had it seized. I have a real problem with it. Teresa Hallbach's DNA was found on a bullet fragment. Correct. Uh, I at least recall no testimony that Teresa Halbach's blood was found on a bullet fragment, but the jury will decide in the yeah. end that. The state established cause of death through Dr. Jensen, who's a forensic pathologist from Milwaukee. And Dr. Jensen testified that Teresa Halbach died as a result of being shot in the head. And in his opinion, the bullet fragment, which is FL, passed through her brain and ended up on Avery's garage floor. The state presented no evidence in the Stephen Avery that any other part of Teresa Halbach's body was shot and that the cause of death was connected to anything other than the bullet fragment FL that was found on the floor in the garage. How many other bullets were there and no, nothing is found in them? Only this one miracle bullet, Big Jeff. One miracle again we got. Jeez. I think item FK is also a bullet that was squashed into the uh, one of the cracks in the concrete. They didn't find anything on FK. Um, but uh, I think the only other thing that was found in the garage with regard to a bullet item was shell casings. Um, 
this is, there's this complete lack of forensic evidence. So the, 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 not, the not finding of stuff to me is the stuff that's in micro splatter. You can't hide that. You can't, you know, you can't clean that up and then put the dust back where it was. It just, it just, it is not sensical um, that, uh, that, that Teresa Hallback was shot in that garage. Somewhere I don't see my, oh, my bucket of scapulas. This is one of three fresh scapulas, bovine scapulas. And as you can see by the backlighting that they're thinnest in here. Things that are more comparable to human skull, around six millimeters, seven, eight, even nine, are down in here. So these are the areas or out in here or over in here where I'll set up and shoot. I'm gonna position one of these against a block of uh, soft tissue simulant at about six inches in length. That's about the distance across a brain. And then second piece of bone, if this bullet is associated with a through and through shot on the victim, it had to go through two pieces of bone, one going in and one coming out. I started talking to ballistic experts about whether a 22 long rifle could exit the skull. And I was told it's a rare, rare event because it's such a small projectile. It doesn't have the energy to exit the skull. But the expert I ended up with, and the one I think is the most knowledgeable, told me it could happen. But he immediately alerted me to the fact that there should be bone fragments in the 22 lead. Okay, guns loaded. Gun safe. Huh. Now we have complete passage through the first block. Did not go through the second piece of bone. This one traveled, see how small that is at the end? It's like a needle point. The velocity is spent. It's, it has, didn't even have the ability to make a mark. Let me fetch that one out to look at back at the uh, conference room. So this is one of the exemplar bullets that was shot by Luke Haig. This brings mm. a lot of the bullet into focus at once. Right here is a, an area that's kind of lighter colored. Yes. And the contrast, and here's another area. I'll show you a better one. Okay. All of this is material that's wow. embedded in the, into the surface of the bullet. All of these whitish areas here. And you can see this is before it was washed. Oh, so, that's so this is after. after it was washed. And so you can see yeah. after the washing for DNA. Uh, that's actually a very crucial point because uh, Colhane had to place the buffer, um, uh, the bullet in the buffer, and hence all the bone fragments came off. Uh, this goes to show doing a reproduction of the uh, alleged shooting event goes to show that the bone shards remain in the lead of the bullet despite uh, doing a DNA prep. So that means that those shards uh, has stuck in the lead. That's a very important observation by uh, Palinik. Material, as we saw in the earlier image. Um, and we'll go and take a look at this then in the SEM, All right. uh, the scanning electron microscope, where we can actually find out what these are composed of. So the SEM, this is the uh, scanning electron microscope, and it uses electrons that are neg negatively charged particles that are accelerated towards the surface of your sample. And then as they bounce off, two things happen. You can collect an image from the sample, or you can get x-rays emitted from the sample, which you can then 
analyze and based on their energy, we can tell what something's made out of. Is it composed of carbon or oxygen? Or in the case of looking for bone, is it composed of calcium and phosphorus? And so this is actually the surface. So you can see some texture here. Mm -hmm. So you can see some other texture over here. Yes. By looking at the elemental data, we can actually figure out determine. what something's made out of. Which is exactly what we need to do. And so if we look here in this small image, are areas that are rich in phosphorus. Yes. And areas that are rich in calcium. And you can see that they correspond to each other. Yes. And if we overlay them, we end up with kind of a mixing of green and red, and we end up with these yellow areas, which are rich in calcium and phosphor. And that would be consistent with bone. Well, the bullet fragment FL from the Attorney General's office, the bullet fragment that was under the air compressor in the garage, the lead was examined by Sherry Colhane for blood, and she never noted that there was any bone fragments. And how did you process that bullet? The first thing I did was just like every item of evidence, it was a visual examination. There was nothing visual on the, the fragment. It was also examined by Mr. Newhouse when he was doing his comparison with Stephen's rifle. Is this a comparison microscope with two fields? Yes, it is. And then you're looking through this microscope and you're making an eyeball comparison based on your judgment, experience, and whatnot, right? Exactly. Here's the point. If FL went through two layers of thickness of her skull, entrance, exit, there would absolutely be bone fragments in the lead. What's important to understand, right, is just putting into context some of the things that, that, we've, that we've just said. Um, Kat, what Kathleen is basically arguing is that you, you, know, you, you can't have your expert witness go in and tell the jury, uh, you know, some type of, uh, you know, you know dog, dog and pony story, yes, you know, some, some type of uh, ex ex excitable story. I'm missing the right adjective, some inflammatory story, uh, and only have the expert witness say that, not repeat it, and not repeat a bit of it, uh, and get away with that. That's what Kathleen is saying. You should you should not be able to do that, right? Is is to sort of have your expert witness be a proxy to tell a story that you don't fall you don't fall back on. But in the state of Wisconsin, they are they were so desperate. They are so desperate to protect the conviction of Stephen Avery. That the answer in Wisconsin is now, oh, oh yeah, you can. That's not a problem. No problem at all. The state can do whatever the f it wants. They can, you know, they they, they could tell uh, the expert witness could could you know could could say that the shot came from Mars, uh, but as long as the prosecutor doesn't, you know, as long as the prosecutor doesn't utter that, uh, then it then it doesn't matter a bit. Th think think about how this is an erosion of the the judicial process. It, it, it just, this is really really. The types of the type of thing that wrangles me about uh, you know the the desperation of Wisconsin. This could pass on uh, to other states as so. This is okay to do in Wisconsin. You know it's okay to it's okay to do in Massachusetts too. It's okay to do in Michigan. It's okay to do in Hawaii. And pretty soon international law will be okay to do in Australia. No problems at all. But, you know it, it's it's these erosions uh, of uh, you know common sense judicial process that you know you, you just even if you're guilty you have to say. And uh, that's not the judicial system I want. And brilliantly said, because if you lower the standards, if you lower the scientific standards, if you lower the bar of what's admissible, it means that you can now pull bullets from the air and say, well, you know, we don't have item FL. Uh, we can't prove item FL actually struck Teresa Hallbuck in the skull. Um, same with uh, item FK. But however, there must have been bullets that had killed her fired from Stephen Avery's gun, uh, we just haven't found them. So when they looked at the burn pit, right, they never found any lead fragments pertaining to bullets. If those bullets were still in her brain, um, hey, it takes a high degree of temperature um, to melt the uh, lead in the bullet, but where is it? Where is it? 
no one has recovered any type of lead fragments from the burn pit. So now you me, it means that the state can live in fantasy land and start pulling bullets from the air. Just a quick question um, to the panel and the chat. I know that it might be jumping the gun too early because we haven't quite finished the whole um, item FL part of uh, Kathleen's um, reconstruction and testing here. But do we think that item FL was uh, subject to plan? Oh, the item FL itself, like the bullet, we all, I think, agree that someone put it there after the fact. Um, but in terms of the planting of the DNA on it, do you guys, where's your heads at? Is it that it was deliberately put on or do you think there was just a really honest cross-contamination cross of because, um, you know, Teresa's DNA was on the bench of uh, Sherry Colhane's uh, lab desk and it's just kind of picked it up. Do we think it's deliberate? Where, where's your head at? Do you think it's deliberate or do you think it was just a, a, a random fluke that this was able to be matched? When you say random fluke, to me that's synonymous with man miracle. And item FL is certainly man Well, yeah, it would have to be a man miracle. I yeah. don't believe in miracles uh, of, of this kind. So I, I just, it's not a fluke. The, prob the, 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 thing, the, the probabilities that have to conspire for that to be, um, you know, accidental is just too much. I, that doesn't mean that, you know, it had to be uh, a certain person because I'm not going to sit here and make an, an accusation. Uh, you know, probably there are certain people that are the most likely people, um, but it, there's other ways that it could have gone there uh, deliberately. Uh, somebody rubbing it against something, what have you, deliberately. Over. Uh, uh, sorry, Big Jeff. For me, there's no way that they planted that bullet per se, as in they got Teresa Horbach's DNA, transported it to the garage, uh, and then all of a sudden magically found it. In my opinion, it's much easier uh, to do all the shenanigans in the privacy of a laboratory. So Colhane has got two outcomes, Kelly. It's either an accidental contamination of the item FL tube, and there's good evidence that there is a contamination event at her bench because she contaminated the negative control. Her other option is a deliberate introduction of Teresa Horbach's DNA inside the tube of item FL, and she amplified it up, and she got a clean, robust profile of a bullet going through Teresa Horbach uh, on that bullet, right? So to me, it's either accidental or deliberate. Now, by the letter of the law, by the letter of the scientific law, a Sheree Cohen could not present that bullet as evidence because she tried to use it um, for uh, to introduce um, Teresa Horbach as being present on that bullet. You could only use a deviation request form to exclude, not to include. And also the deviation to request form was not fit for purpose because her own supervisor, Marie Variali, never signed it. I'd have to agree with Doc um, because if they had brought the bullet there with DNA on it, there's the risk of other DNA being present that shouldn't have ever been there, right? So I think that for control purposes, it had to be done at the lab. That's my opinion. In fairness, it wasn't until I've just started like going through my paperwork that I realized there's actually a third alternative now into the mix. And I think it's only fair that we balance it in there. Whether you guys take it into consideration or not, I, I think it's fair that I put it in there because Kathleen Zona has now put it forward um, and it's now in court records. And that is that she has now suggested in her Avery reply that it was actually Bobby Dassey that not only planted the bullet, that also put Teresa's DNA on it. So whether you guys want to incorporate that into like your, like that is a possibility, but I just thought we, to bring the balance, that is now a suggested new alternative that I think we should have on the table as a consideration because it's fair, because it is now in court record that that is something that she is bringing forward. 
Yeah, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, we, you know, despite whatever Slavinsky saw, uh, things he saw, you know, that to me is a, and now I'm talking about specifically him pushing along with some other older person, the RAV4 on that particular day uh, and so forth. That's a, to me, that's a completely separate thing than planting a bullet, which there's just no way. I'm sorry. I just don't believe that at all. I just don't. Not even as a suggestion. I don't. Could he have potentially been pushing that RAV? I guess so. I don't know that I necessarily believe it, but um, it's certainly, I think it's worth having a discussion with, uh, you know, the various people. But as far as planting that bullet, no, I just, no, I'm sorry. I, I can't go there. I mean, I, this this has been a consistent theme from Kathleen since the uh, rejection of the motion. And I, I think we kind of all agree that um, if if she... In her, in her motion has anything left of shenanigans by the state then that anything in that appeal is dead on arrival so you know now, now she's going out of her way to make statements so facetious to, to sort of notionally recuse the state of any wrongdoing and, and I think this fits into that um, you know that category in, that, in, in my mind yeah, uh, I agree. This is way too sophisticated for someone like Bobby Dassey to do. Um, there's no doubt that this was probably an accidental contamination in the lab. But you know what worries me? The mere fact that that Fassbender phoned up Cherie Cohane and said to her, try to put her in his garage or house. That tends to point to culpability of it being a deliberate contamination event because item FL is crucial for the state because it actually confirms that uh, what they did to Teresa Orbach was indeed true. If you have a bullet in a garage with a decedent's DNA on it, that means that she must have been there. That's how critical it is. But now Kathleen Zellner has destroyed that notion through uh, Chris Palahniuk and her own reconstructions. That bullet was not the instrument of Teresa Orbach's death and they cannot prove or link that Stephen A. Stephen Avery had fired that Marlin rifle uh, that's in his bedroom and that that bullet had struck Teresa Hallbach anywhere. They cannot prove it. In fact, they have not associated Ida Mathel with the cranial bone fragments. Dr. Silkman, at the end of the day, isn't the smell test for uh, Norm Gahn's argu argument uh, for the layman very simple? Um, you know, he, he argues that, oh yeah, this this, this deviation, it's, it's just so obvious um, that, this, that, that, that this was the case. Uh, for, you know, for, for this case, they should be interpreted like that. Isn't, isn't the smell test for the correctness of that, uh, whether they will go back and update the manual to reflect you know, a sub note that says, well, you know, if this happens, then you can go around it because it's just so obvious, right? It was, it was the manual um, updated to your knowledge? No, look, we failed second year students for less the students used to do a PCR experiment uh, where they amplified up their own DNA. Uh, and one of the uh, experimental um, samples was a, a DNA control. And one of the questions that we put in the write-up was, um, if you find DNA in a negative control, can you state anything about your own DNA result? And the proper answer is no. You have to discard all results. Norm Gahn tried to turn back science 200 years into the Norm Gahn show. And also, Doc, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, and the rest of you, uh, didn't Sher Sherry Colhane say earlier on in the t in her testimony that if she didn't see a stain, she didn't test it? I can remember Buting. I think it was Buting that said, when you looked at the RAV, um, what made you decide to go test something, i.e. for DNA? She goes, I look for a red-brown stain. I do a presumptive test. If the presumptive test is positive, I do another swab and I extract genomic DNA. Uh, she clearly didn't see any blood, tissue, brain matter, nothing on Item FL, but she clearly had processed it because Item FL was the linchpin, the game changer for Mr. Kratz. Well, it's not like there's ever a good time to wrap it up, but it's always a good time to hear from Big Jeff. So I think at this point we will throw it on over to Big Jeff and do a little bit of wrap-up so uh, we can uh, – 
and get out of this episode 30. So, Big Jeff, I'll uh, hand it over to you. Well, the only request I have, Jeff, is that when we go to see whether my bold prediction was correct regarding the amount of time, that we don't count the introduction of the of, of man because I know that takes a good couple of you know, minutes or so. <laughs> and I don't know whether my prediction was was on target or not, but I you know it, it, it went about the way that I uh, expected. Um, I you know I really am enjoying this episode. It's a it's a it's a good episode, and I really think that the uh, the commentary from the panel just makes it all that much uh, much more interesting. I love to hear uh, Dr. Silkman and uh, you know talk about the expertise and, and Kel talk about the you know the the subtleties of of, of what was said by the Court of Appeals. So I think that's critically important in understanding what's what's going on here. Uh, this is Kathleen Zellner at her finest, trying to you know really determine what went on, what evidence do we have, um, and her arguments. You know, even you know e even though we've had them in front of us for for a long time, you know, I, I watch some of this stuff now and I'm like, oh my god, I didn't really think of the way that she put it forward. Um, you know, she's she's top notch. Uh, she's aces in my book, and. Uh, you know, uh, look forward to her continued, you know, to just gaining the insight from her continued unraveling of the of the state's case. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Big Jeff. And seeing, uh, we'll go right down the list next to Dr. Silkman. Dr. Silkman, thanks for your expertise in some of these more forensic related elements like we've seen today. Uh, thank you very much, guys, in panel and in chat. Um, look, guys, you've got to understand the um, forensics and the laws regarding the admissibility of item FL are very, very clear cut. They're simple. They're in black and white. They're in a laboratory manual. Uh, controls are very important because they protect, they protect the law. They protect the uh, person doing the experiment and they protect the reputation of a laboratory. And the Jack 61 will tell you what happened to those two um, analysis who were, were mucking around with all the drug testing results, over 10,000 cases had to be thrown out. That's serious. And that's why we have controls. And let me tell you right now, if Norm Garn uh, was in my laboratory uh, and he came up with a statement like that, he would have been thrown out of the laboratory, laughed. And he, you could imagine if any of my professors heard Norm Garn saying, people will understand, we can break the rules, we don't have to worry about controls the importance of the scientific integrity of controls is sacrosanct. Absolutely. You do not break it for any reason at all. The mere fact that Cohane used up all the DNA sample is very, very telling. She did the same thing with the key. So my blood pressure is through the roof and um, thing, I need medical assistance. Oh, geez. Well, I hope you get your help that you need. Get you uh, get Get your nurse uh, ASAP here. Uh, Jack, you've uh, seen a lot, uh, really getting to the meat and potatoes, the nuts and bolts of this case, really in the depths of it. Uh, give us your feedback for today. Well, I can't add too much to what Big Jeff and, and Dr. Sutman have already said, but, you know, um, again, looking at calls in a, in a really effect or what we end up with. And, you know, this... This whole thing surrounding Brendan to get this statement, and then bam, within a very short time, they actually started you know, riding the, heading that way and riding search warrants the afternoon of March 1st to get back in that garage so they could find the uh, item FL, you know, uh, by whatever means that they did what they did. You end up with this bullet fragment that has nothing on it. Sherry Colhane has already stated she, she doesn't really test anything. She, she can't see a stain, but she does anyway. As Dr. Silkman said, she used up all the DNA. It can't be retested. Uh, Beauty and the strain wanted to be present when it was tested, but that was denied. And they ended up contamin contaminating the negative control anyway. It's laughable. It's just so laughable. Anyway, I, I'm not going to ramble on about that. We'll cover, I'm sure, more of it. But I will say that you know, if this ever comes to a, you know, some other type of hearing where Sherry Colleen is called to testify, she's got a lot of questions to answer for in my book. I, I think Dr. Sutman and probably the rest of the panel and the live chatter would agree with that. She's got a hell of a lot to answer for because she was in control. She bragged about it, basically. And her she controlled all the samples. She took them. They had She had everything. 
She could do whatever the hell she wanted, and she did, in my opinion. Yeah, Kel, if you wouldn't please uh, lead us out of episode 30, a little bit of a milestone for us. Ah, uh, well, um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. And um, I just want to say thank you for Jeff, Big Jeff, especially for pointing out how critically important it is that we do go over the courts of appeal. Um, when I read all these things out, it's just to bring into the reality of where we are now um, because it does, it reflects where Kathleen is at. The issue with Kath, the issue that Kathleen kind of has is she incorporates item FL in her uh, state reply, the response. Um, but in all legal technicality, item FL is actually procedurally barred at this stage. So the judge or the judges, if it goes to courts of appeal, they may dismiss all of that on the fact that the procedural bar, the, the barring is still a very real obstacle in this case that Kathleen has to overcome. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, I gave you guys the alternatives between what we were thinking and uh, it wasn't until I kind of triggered myself and went, hang on a minute, this has already been addressed by courts of appeal. What does it really matter what we think? Which it does matter what we think because we all have an opinion. Um, but you know how I always like to focus on the now and in the reality of it is the now is the alternative that she's put forward is it's Bobby because the item FL and the time between uh, the crime lab and the planning of item FL with this um, law enforcement has already been heard, seen and denied. So the only alternative legally that um, the Judge Angela will have to consider is the one that it's Bobby that Bobby did it all because that's the only one that she's now suggesting. Um, but I just want to, I like I said, I just wanted to keep the balance. But yeah, I just want to thank everyone and on to the next. Well, thank you very much, Kel. And yeah, we do want to bring balance and we do want to bring what's up to date now, what's happening in the case now. So it's really important, just like uh, Big Jeff said, it's uh, important to to bring those stuff forward. And we appreciate those efforts, Kel. We really do. Um, so for Cal and Big Jeff and Dr. Silkman and Jack, this is Jeff Jones saying this has been discussing a murderer.